Hello, everyone, and welcome to Move Daily Talks. I'm here today with Dr. Sharon Stills. I'm really excited to have her back as a guest. I've had her on our membership to come and speak to our special challenge participants multiple times. So it's a real pleasure for me to welcome her back again. She is so knowledgeable, especially in the field of menopause. And I'm in that field myself. <laughs> I'm in that zone myself. So for me to be able to ask her questions that are super relevant to where I'm at is a total blessing. So I'm really excited to introduce her to you today. She's a naturopathic medical doctor who provides comprehensive healthcare, therapeutic and diagnostic services to patients around the world. She combines her conventional medical training, data-driven science, cutting-edge diagnostic tools, and a deep knowledge of natural healing to effectively identify and treat health concerns ranging from allergies to end-stage cancer and everything in between. Dr. Sharon is also the host of the Mastering the Menopause Transition Summit. I've been a part of that summit for a couple years in a row now. I'm very excited to be participating again this fall. And uh, that is a summit that specializes in women's health and menopause. So be sure to join us in September for that. If you're part of my email list, of course, you will receive notification when that is about to start. But for today, let's welcome together Dr. Sharon Stills. Well, welcome everyone. And thanks so much for joining us here, Move Daily Talks. And again, I am with Dr. Sharon Stills, one of my friends who I have chatted with multiple times, and she's always a wealth of knowledge. I always learn something from you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> same sister, same. <laughs> I know. That's, it's a good... It's a good field to be in this health and wellness. And I mean, things are always changing in this field too, which can make it challenging, right? You know, staying yeah. current, right? Staying yeah. current with the new science. And uh, sometimes I feel like that's a bit frustrating for me, even as a trainer, just because people will come and say, well, you know, this person says this, this person says that you must get that a lot in this menopause space as well. Yeah, I feel like, you know, it's definitely a full time job and a commitment to keep up with the latest and the greatest. And then on the flip side, there's just timeless information that just withstands no matter what study or what comes out that is always going to be applicable. And yeah, yeah you know, the menopause space is noisy and a lot of that noise is static <laughs> and misinformation which is why I'm so passionate about sharing the truth and getting you know good information out there so women don't have to suffer when there's no reason to suffer. Yeah, I like what you said there that there are some foundational truths that just don't change. Oh yeah. 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 So lots of good, good content. And we're going to be talking about some of that today, but you, you haven't always been in this menopause space. So I am curious how you segued from not maybe focusing on women in menopause. And then all of a sudden now this is your main, you know, people group. Well, actually when I, I did, I went to naturopathic medical school back in 1997, I graduated in 2001 so a long time ago, 23 years ago, and I initially went to be a pediatrician and never really worked with women's hormones or anything. And then when I opened my clinic, uh, it was like right around when Suzanne Summers had written her first book, The Sexy Years. And I had a patient come in because I, you know, I was a general practice and I had a patient come in and she was like, you know, I want what she's having. Like, I want these bioidentical hormones. And honestly, in medical school, I like it heard a little bit about hormones, but not a lot. It wasn't like a focus. Like everything I do now is not what I learned in school. It's what I right. learned. After. <laughs> and so I had her give me the book. You know, I suspended my judgment about Suzanne Summers because at the time I only knew her as Chrissy from Three's Company <laughs> and Blonde. Um, and, you know, rest her soul because she passed away recently, but she really was a game changer and a trailblazer. And I read the book and I thought, wow, I can really help this woman. Plus, I can make it even better because I am a physician and I have a global understanding of the body. And so I did. I got her these hormones, the bioidentical hormones. 
And it was literally like that pert, remember the pert shampoo commercial? She told two friends and she told two friends and it literally just spread like wildfire. And the next thing I knew, I was like a menopausal bioidentical hormone expert. And even looking back, I mean, this is in 2002. So 22 years ago. And like, I've learned so much from back then to how I work with women now. And I feel like I've really mastered it. And so it just became something I became passionate about. And when I wanted to serve more women online, I thought, you know, there's so much I can teach about whether someone's a patient or not, that they can benefit from my experience working with, you know, tens of thousands of patients at this point. And so that's kind of, when I first started, I was, I was in my early thirties. So I was helping all these menopausal women. And I was like the furthest thing. Menopause wasn't on my mind. I, I had extreme, like extreme PMS. I'd feel good maybe one week out of the month. And so they kind of taught me, I thought, wow, I'm watching these women who are 20, 30, 40 years older than me. And they're like getting their mojo back and they're losing weight and they're feeling great and all this stuff. And so I thought, I'm going to apply that to me because I can't be sitting here, you know, bloated, like I'm nine months pregnant because I have such bad PMS helping these women with their hormones when I'm a hormonal disaster. And so I applied what I was doing with them to me as a cycling woman, so much so that my PMS went away. And when I went through menopause, I never had any symptoms. I didn't, it's funny, someone was, I was interviewing someone for my summit and we were talking about Ayurveda and she was like, well, you're a Pitta, you know, and Pitta, my red hair, and that's heat and fire. She's like, so, you know, your menopause must have been, you know, tons of hot. I was like, I'm not a good example because I really pre-gamed. I was like, I've never had a hot flash. I don't know what a hot flash feels like. Um, but so that's how I kind of got into this whole menopause thing. And it's just really rewarding because I see, you know, I just had a patient here this morning and it's like, just after a couple of weeks, she's like, I have more energy. I don't need a nap. I'm sleeping better. I'm this, I'm that. Like it, it, it's a real, you know, health is not always instant gratification, but when you get your hormones balanced, when they've been deficient, it's kind of a, you know, you notice it fairly quickly. Yeah. And so it's interesting to me that you said that in perimenopause, which is what you were in, you were, you were looking at what you were doing for the menopausal women and applying some of that to yourself. So what were those things that you were applying? What are, what are some of the pregame strategies that we could use in order to maybe stave off some of the menopausal symptoms that are so fatiguing? Yeah. And I actually, I wasn't even perimenopausal yet. I was in my early thirties. So, uh, you know, perimenopause typically is not till your later thirties, you know, early forties. One of them was really supporting my liver, um, whether it was using my castor oil packs or taking supplements to move my liver pathways, making sure my bile was flowing. Because we talk about phase one and phase two of liver detox. We often forget phase three, which is the bile flow, which to me is probably like the most important phase. <laughs> Um, I, I started taking progesterone and looking at my DHEA levels and looking at my melatonin and looking at my testosterone, you know, just looking at all the things I was making sure my estrogens were metabolizing down the right pathway and not inflammatory. I was eating right. I was moving my body. I was prioritized sleeping. I was working on regulating my nervous system, you know, all these like we said in the beginning, all these tried and tested, I was making sure hydration was, you know, optimized and important to me because I had not really been paying attention to my hydration. I was, it was early in my, you know, I had just graduated. I had just opened the clinic. So I was like, just, you know, pedal to the metal. I would see patients sometimes for like 10 hours straight. And I learned, no, I can't do that. You know, I need to practice what I preach. I need breaks. I need to sit down. I need to chew my food. So those were a handful of the things. Yeah, that those were so many good tips right there in that one, one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> you gave us so much good nuggets right there. So lifestyle changes obviously can help us to alleviate some of these menopausal symptoms that we might be going through. Um, what about, okay, so let's talk about lifestyle changes and maybe some dietary recommendations 
perhaps that you might suggest to help us through these stages? Yeah, I think uh, we'll do diet first. So um, you've probably heard it before, but prioritizing protein and prioritizing good sources of protein. But what I will add to that that's often forgotten is you need to make sure you're actually absorbing your protein. So I see patients frequently who are like, yes, you know, I'm eating the grass fed and grass finished steak and I'm eating eggs for breakfast. And yes, they're free range. And then I run levels on them and I'm like, you have no protein in your body. And so you go, well, wait, but you're eating it. So we're not, you know, that's saying you are what you eat. It's actually, you are what you absorb. Mm. So hydrochloric stomach acid, I find like nine out of 10 women, maybe 10 out of 10 women, I see it all the time are deficient and hydrochloric acid is our stomach acid. And it's what we need to break down the protein we eat so that it becomes digestible, gets split into the minute um, amino acids. And it's that um, acidic bolus of food that then goes into the small intestine and triggers the pancreatic enzyme release, the cholecystokinin from the gallbladder. So we we hear a lot about, we gotta be alkaline, we gotta be alkaline. Um, we gotta be alkaline in certain places and we gotta be acidic in others. And two of those places are our stomach and our vaginal canal. We don't wanna be over alkalinized. So it's important. And you could do a betaine challenge test where you get, we use Biotics Research has a product I like called Betaine Plus HP. Um, we give you a handout, but basically what it's saying in the middle of your dinner, a large size meal with protein, take one pill in the middle. And if you don't feel anything, then the next day, take two pills and keep titrating up and challenging yourself till you feel some warm sensation or you feel heartburn. So say okay. you got up to six and you felt the heartburn, then that means you've gotten too high. You would eat some protein to sop it up. It means you have too much acid. And then you would start taking five in the middle of each meals. And the goal is eventually that, you know, you wouldn't need five and you can titrate down to four and to three. But without hydrochloric acid, not only are we not going to absorb our protein, but we're not going to absorb calcium and B vitamins and minerals. So it's a really important, easy to fix, commonly found, but commonly overlooked. Um, so that's, you know, for diet, of course, the general things, eating organic, I do think that's important, making sure your meat is grass fed and finished. It's a real slick marketing trick where they say, it's grass fed, but then they forget to tell you that they finish it off with grain. So it's got to say grass fed and finished. It's okay. not an, I didn't know that. Grass fed. Yeah. You know, yeah. marketing people are very yeah. sneaky, right? They, they don't care about you. It look like me and Tracy. Yeah. Do. They just care about selling you a product. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and eating, I think it's, it's different for every season, every person, every constitution, like right now, it's like 110 degrees outside. We're only in June, you know, so you see me, I'm, I'm drinking the water. My water's a little colder than normal. Um, having a salad or a smoothie because I want cooling foods. Mm -hmm. So when it's winter, it's not such a great idea to eat salads and smoothie. You want to eat soups and stews and things of that nature. Um, so just making sure you're eating seasonally, you're eating right. You know, I really like understanding either from an Ayurvedic perspective or traditional Chinese medicine perspective or a homeopathic perspective, like what constitution are you? Because like, if you are, um, high Vata, which is air in Ayurveda, then eating a lot of raw, dry foods is not good because your your body's already too dry. And so you have, you know, joint pain. So you don't want to be eating the salads. You want to cook your foods and steam your foods. So it's hard to just say this is what everyone should eat because it's so different. But, you know, obviously... Um, no soda, you know, I'm not a big fan of alcoholic beverages. Um, you know, I rarely drink at this point. It really messes with our hormones. And as we get whole, older, it messes with our nervous system even more. Um, you know, making sure you're hydrated, not doing, um, you know, a lot of juice and things of that nature, making sure when you're drinking your water, you're putting some kind of electrolyte in it. 
So I think just some of those basic things um, yeah. and certainly timing. So stop eating three hours before bedtime is a huge one. Um, eat your largest meal in the middle of the day because that's when your agni or your digestive fire is the biggest. So like we just had our, um, you know, we had these protein bowls. We just finished them like an hour and a half ago. You know, that was my main meal of the day. And that was at like 1.30ish. Um, so, you know, I won't eat a big heavy dinner now. I eat it in the middle of the day. Um, if you're someone who has adrenal issues or you have blood sugar issues, then making sure you um, eat like protein within an hour of waking up, maybe inter you know intermittent fasting, good for some, not good for others, um, maybe good for you sometimes, but not all the time. So not just, you know, hearing the latest and greatest online. I mean, me personally, and what I end up prescribing most often to patients, but of course there's exceptions, is more of a paleo diet, higher protein, lower grains, um, you no know, dairy, no gluten. So those are just some of the, some of the tips. Yeah. I like, I like what you said that, you know, seasonally it could be different when you have specific targets, you might have a different approach. Uh, I think that too, you know, for a bit, intermittent fasting was the queen and she was out there and everyone was doing it, but you know, if a target of yours is to increase lean muscle tissue and you need that adequate amount of protein, it's very hard to get it in a small window, right? How do you exactly. eat enough in order to attain that target? So I think that's really important because we don't want to, you know, swipe it with one pen and say that everyone has to do it this way. And this is the only way to reach your goals because everyone is so, so different. So thanks for mentioning that. I think that's crucial to remember. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, like intuitively, like mindful, intuitive eating, mm -hmm. you, you know, if you really get, you, you know, like, oh, this is really nurturing me, or this is what I'm, you know, I really feel like I need some broccoli. And, you know, if you're totally craving sweet, that's a good sign that maybe you're deficient in protein. If you're totally craving chocolate, you may be deficient in magnesium. So letting your body's cravings kind of show you are these healthy cravings, are these signs of deficiencies, and kind of knowing. If we really slow down and sit down and chew our food, we should really chew our food till it's till it's Taste, liquid. Paste. So, yep. so if, you, if you spit it out, no one would be able to identify what it is you were actually eating. <laughs> and so if we do that, you know, then we get into that parasympathetic, we're able to digest easier. And we start to listen to our own wisdom. And we kind of know, eh, I shouldn't be eating that, you know, I don't really need that. And if we eat, I love, um, it's a Japanese term that I always forget, but it's about eating till you're 70, 80% full. I think it's in carry, I, I should really write it down because I talk about it all the time. I never remember the name, but you know, don't eat till you're stuffed, right? Eat till you're comfortable. Walk away for 20 minutes. If you're still truly hungry, then go for it. Come back and eat more. But more often than not, you won't you'll, be. You'll be satisfied. Yeah. And so then we're not over. And I think it's also important to, you know, not be grazing all day, like eat a meal. And then give your body time to digest it and to um, not be overloaded, um, you know, grazing all day long at the fridge. So those yeah. would be some other ideas. Yeah, that's those are great tips too. Um, and lifestyle changes. So we talked about dietary changes, and those were those were helpful. Lifestyle changes. Let's talk a little bit about sleep, um, movement. I think I've got that covered pretty much. <laughs> We, we, we need to build muscle. We need to move our bodies daily, but what about that, you know, self-care? What about the restorative component? What about sleep and the crucialness of that? Uh, what, what do you see come into your clinic? What's your advice in terms of that? Yeah. So yeah, I was, you took the words right out of my mouth, like definitely movement, but you've totally got that covered and you're my guru. Um, so sleep is an interesting one because so I was saying this the other day to someone, but menopause is like this really interesting, it's not a disease, it's just a natural process, a natural transition. And if you are, you know, 20 and you're not sleeping, 
then it's different if you're 45 or 50 and you're not sleeping because your progesterone crashed. So we can't out, we can't supplement our way out of deficient hormones. We can't even really eat our way or move our way out of deficient hormones. It's really this one time where we need to replace the hormones. So if you are struggling with sleep and you've tried it all, you've done the dark bedroom, you've turned off the Wi-Fi, you're wearing your blue blockers, you're doing your lavender spray, you're taking a nice cold shower, warm bath, you're drinking your chamomile tea, and you're still not sleeping, like progesterone can really be like your best friend. And it's really the solution. But you also, I don't want you to get the idea that you don't need to do all the wonderful lifestyle things. And you can just work on your way to feeling better. It really, it's like, I kind of like have this invisible handshake with patients, right? Like, we're going to do the hormones, but we're also going to work on the gut and the lymph and the sleep and the emotions and all these things. So if you have high stress levels and you are putting out too much cortisol at the wrong point of the day, which would be at night, you might have a hard time falling asleep. If your adrenals are depleted, you might fall asleep easily, but you might wake up in the middle of the night. If your blood sugar is out of range, you might wake up in the middle of the night because your blood sugar is dropping where a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor can give us a ton of information. I love those, um, they're very informative. So I think prioritizing sleep, like me and sleep are like, we were laughing because we went out to celebrate my son's birthday on Saturday night and we went to this tasting course and they were super slow serving us. So we had dinner at five, like, I was like, I'll be home by 7, 7.30. We didn't get home till like 9.30. It was like the slowest five-course dinner I've ever been to. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like, already should be sleeping and keeping me up late. <laughs> you know, so I really prioritize my sleep. And this was a one-time thing and I got right back on track. But we want to make sure that if we do have a celebratory night and we're out, we don't then, you know, start staying out late every night. And I'm like, 9.30 was late for me, but... Um, you know, even if you go to bed, like 10 to 1030 is an optimal time to go to bed. I'm just in this earlier stage. It's really hot here. So I get up early before before it hits 100 by seven o'clock. <laughs> um, so you want to make sure that you are going to bed and sleeping at the regular like, you know, like a baby, like you get yourself on a schedule. And of course, you have some flexibility if a special occasion comes out, but you don't want to be just one more binge show, you know, just one more episode or one more email or one more scroll or whatever it is that you're doing. I mean, optimally, you shouldn't be on machines and phones and before bedtime, you know, maybe reading a book or journaling or meditating or, um, you know, if you are watching something, make sure you're not doing Wi-Fi, you're downloaded, you're in airplane mode, you've got your blue blockers on. And I think just really realizing like sleep and movement to me, those like are in the calendar, right? So I know I'm going to move. Exercise is important. Plan your day around it. And I know, no, I'm not doing something super late because that's going to cut into my sleep. Like this is my schedule. So I always say, you know, I'm all big about the pre-gaming, but I, I say like triaging the pre-gaming for sleep. If you go to bed at 10 by seven, you're like scanning the area, you know, all right, the clothes are dry, but they can wait till tomorrow to be folded. The dishes are in the sink, but I can run some water. I can wash them in the morning. Or maybe you can't, maybe you, you know, like figuring out, you know, this email has to be sent or this phone call must be made or that whatever needs to be done, but like realizing, okay, this stuff is just going to wait till tomorrow and being okay with it. And then having a ritual, like having a routine of what you do. And it can vary because sometimes I find if you do the same thing over and over and over, then it becomes less, um, you know, flow and it becomes more rigid. And it's like, okay, now I have to drink my chamomile tea and I have to spray my lavender. So like having a bunch of things to pull from and being like, oh, tonight I feel like I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to pick one from this column and one from that column. But having things that tell your body, 
it's time to chill. We're going to yeah. go to bed. Yeah. The great tips. So good. And I, I especially loved the quick reset. I say that too, in terms of, you know, fitness and nutrition. So, so many people will throw the baby out with the bathwater or maybe go out and have a night or, you know, overindulge in a meal, miss a workout. And really what you want to do is people like us do things like this forever and ever, right? This is our, this is who, who we are. So we're getting right back on track the very next meal or that very next morning. We're not going to wait till January 1st or September 1st. People exactly. like us don't do that, right? We have a quick reset and we're right back on track. So I yeah. love I love that you said that. <laughs> and I mean, um, I think when you, you know, I love that people like us, but yeah. you also, it's like when you live in a healthy um, rhythm, yes. then you, you miss it. It's yeah. like, you don't want to do the things that make you feel bad. You want to be in tune and be doing the good choices because you get the benefit. You're like energetic and you feel good and you sleep good and all the things. That's right. And then you enter a room differently. Like you show up differently you have more confidence, like it just changes you as a person. So yeah, good. Uh, we had a question from one of our members. She said, have you seen much success with testosterone for women in perimenopause or menopause relating to libido? Do you look at total serum testosterone or free androgen index as an indicator? So sex and libido, That's a good what do question. we have to say about that? So testosterone, surprisingly, is our most abundant hormone. We think it's estrogen. And like compared to men, we have less testosterone, but we have a lot of testosterone. Sometimes too much can be a problem. And every woman is different. So when I do testing, I'm looking. Some women lose their testosterone like before they lose anything. Other women go through menopause and their testosterone is on a slower decline than their estrogen and progesterone. It's very interesting and very individualized. I do 24 hour urine testing. I do look in the blood um, for testosterone to see if I can make correlations. Often, I just had this this morning with a patient, often testosterone elevates in the blood because it's catching it in your serum. And so you think you have more than you actually have. I do look at, um, I think you said, do you look at total testosterone or an androgen index? Yes. What you want to look at is free testosterone or bioavailable testosterone because total testosterone means total, which means what you have that's free and available to make an impact at the receptor site and what's bound. And so total testosterone can be misleading. So you want to look at the free testosterone. It's just like with thyroid, you look at free T3. You don't look at total T3 because that's what's actually available and can make an impact and change at the cellular receptor site. Um, you also want, you know, if you're taking testosterone or want to know what's going on with your testosterone, I always say to run a DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone because testosterone metabolizes down. And if too much is going to DHT, then you'll have low testosterone levels and high DHT levels, which can cause hair loss. So that's an important one to monitor. And also SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin, because if that goes too high, sex hormone binding globulin is like the choo-choo train and it can bind thyroid hormone, it can bind testosterone. And if it's high, then it binds the testosterone. And when you get to the train stop, it doesn't let the testosterone off and the train stop is your cells. So you also need to be monitoring that. And if you're taking testosterone, in addition, monitor a CBC with a differential because it happens more with men, but it can happen with women um, that your hemoglobin and your hematocrit and your red blood cells will elevate. And you don't want them to elevate because that can cause problems with thick sludgy blood. So that also needs to be monitored. And don't do testosterone pellets, just as a side note, because they overdose you. <laughs> okay. So what is the recommendation then? Uh, cream. Cream. So okay. cream does, you know, I dose anywhere from one to six milligrams typically a day to the external labia. And sometimes it's every other day. Sometimes it's just twice a week, three times a week. Testosterone's one that varies, again, individual. I mean, everything varies individually, but some women can be super sensitive. Like I had a patient last week 
And, you know, if she took three lines instead of two lines, it can give symptoms, right? So you just, you need to look at the feedback, right? Are you growing a mustache? Are you getting aggressive? Are you having hair issues? And just a little tweak down can make the symptoms go away and really get your levels where they need to be. Speaking of how you take these hormones, could you tell us maybe your recommendations on uh, the best way to take estrogen and progesterone as well? So estrogen is a cream like testosterone to the external labia, which is the mucosal tissue. You don't want to be applying estrogen or progesterone to your skin because you'll get dermal fatigue. You want to apply it to the external labia, which is mucosal tissue, moist. We can use less and get better absorption. And progesterone, I actually prescribe as a cream and a capsule because it has very different mechanisms of action. Typically, the capsule will cross the blood-brain barrier. It will turn into allopregnenolone, which will affect GABA in the brain, which is the inhibitory, quiet us down, sleepy time, neurotransmitter. And then when we do the progesterone cream, we have more of an effect on stimulating osteoblasts for bone growth. And we have more of an effect on the uterus and breast health and blood sugar. So I always split the dose and do a little little bit of each. So would you like, what about the patch? What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know very much about this, but I have some friends that have this, some friends that are using that, you know, and. So usually the patch is for estrogen. So what I see a yeah. lot, like from a typical OBGYN is here's an estradiol patch and here's some oral progesterone. And again, I do 24 hour urine testing. And so I am. Um, I do this like second opinion consult for women where they don't have to be a patient. They can do a 24 hour urine test with me. And then I spend 45 minutes on zoom and I go over their results with them. And it's interesting because a lot of these women come in like on a patch and on some oral progesterone. And for the most part, they need testosterone, they need DHEA, they need extra progesterone cream, they need estriol mm -hmm. added in because they're only taking estradiol. Right. Um, but you know, there's like, and I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, but maybe 10% of the women who I see who come in on that. And I'm like, woo, nice surprise. Like, this isn't what I expect to be working for you, but it actually is pretty much working for you. And maybe they just need a little tweak. Yeah. So the way I do it for the most part is you get a bias, which is estriol and estradiol. You get testosterone cream. The estri the estri the bias is also a cream. You get progesterone cream and capsule. Um, melatonin, we do in a liposomal spray. DHEA and pregnenolone, we do as liposomal drops. It absorbs better and it's cheaper than compounding creams. Um, oxytocin is a nasal spray. So I've kind of discovered and found um, the best way for each hormone to be absorbed. Mm -hmm. Thyroid is just, you know, a little tablet you swallow. So, um, but those are the basics. Yeah. No, that's very informative, informative as well. Just, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to figure out. Do you have, I can't remember if you, I know that you've talked to us before and if uh, anyone wants to hear this chat, but uh, Dr. Stills went deep into the breakdown of estrogen and progesterone. Like you remember that slide presentation that you did with us? It was very detailed and it was fabulous. Um, where can people, yes, work with you or find you or come to some of your courses or uh, anything like that? Can you let us know that? Um, well, I have a menopause summit coming up that you're yes. going to be on. So I host a menopause summit every year. This is our third year. I'm already signed up for my fourth year with Dr. Talks. It, um, this one will launch October 1st. We typically launch it and it's seven days of like seven or eight talks In a day. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all free initially. You can watch what you want. And I go pretty in depth there. And then if you get on my mailing list, like if you just go to drstills.com and you sign up for my newsletter, like I send a lot of information through there and you can see, I mean, you can just Google me, like Tracy was saying, I've talked to her numerous times. Um, so there's lots of ways to learn 
and hear information. I always do some deep after the summit, I'll do some webinars and really teach more specifically. And I teach a class every morning at the summit and I try to hit all the highlights um, to give you the information that you need. Yeah. You, again, are such a wealth of information and I thank you so much for coming on and just sharing that. I Like when you were talking, like I said, that one paragraph, I, I think you probably had 20 tips in there. I'm like, check, check. <laughs> so much good stuff. That's awesome. Okay, well, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, you can follow Dr. Sharon Stills over on Instagram at Dr. Sharon Stills. She has a website, which is drsharonstills.com. Just after drstills.com. drstills.com. So if you want to work with her, um, you know, have these conversations like she was talking about, uh, definitely look her up because again, a wealth of information. If you live in the Phoenix area, you could just call her up and visit her over there as well. Yeah, we have patients fly in from all over and we actually have a new clinic we're opening That's the right. early 2025. So That's still so center. Exciting. And that will be not just menopause. We will be working with patients of, you know, just trying to stay healthy or patients yeah. who have end stage cancer and are looking to reverse that. So I love that. That's so great. Working hard to make a difference, and you do. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. All oh, right, folks. You. You're welcome. Thanks for joining, everyone. We'll see you in the next Move Daily Talks.